Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio from Monday, December 6, 2021. National political leaders from both parties paying tribute to Bob Dole, the former Republican senator and presidential candidate who died on Sunday. Many of them using words like hero and statesman and speaking of a time when Republicans and Democrats fought hard over policy but respected each other. We'll hear from senators and presidential historian Richard Norton Smith and speak with the 1996 Dole for President National Press Secretary Nelson Warfield. Also today, White House announces U.S. diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Winter Olympics, citing human rights concerns in China. Justice Department suing Texas over its legislative redistricting boundaries, saying they violate the Voting Rights Act by watering down minority voter strength. A look ahead at the week in Congress with Roll Call Deputy Editor Jason Dick and New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio mandates COVID-19 vaccines for employees of all private businesses in the city. That and more coming up on Washington Today. This from the Kansas City Star, Bob Dole, a son of the Kansas Dust Bowl who survived a crippling barrage of Nazi fire on an Italian hillside to lead his party in the U.S. Senate, but who fell short of his highest ambition, the presidency, died on Sunday. He was 98. Proud, uncommonly driven, and possessed of a dark, self-effacing wit, Dole went to Washington a rock-hard Great Plains conservative, but evolved into a pragmatic master of legislative compromise. That from the star. Dole began his career in the 1950s in Kansas as a state representative and then a county attorney, elected to the U.S. House in 1960 and then the U.S. Senate in 1968. He served there until 1996, rising to Republican leader, and he stepped down to run for president. He was also, by the way, the 1976 Republican vice presidential nominee, And in all, he ran for president three different times, never winning that presidency. Tributes today on the Senate floor in Washington, including the current Republican leader, Mitch McConnell. Hard to believe it's been 25 years since Senator Dole took leave of the Senate. It's even harder to believe he passed away this past weekend. Not because it comes as a shock to say goodbye, to an elder statesman at age 98, but because our colleague was still so energetic, so involved, and so forward-looking right through to his final months. If you didn't know Bob Dole, if you just read a summary of his impressive Senate career, his leadership tenure, his presidential campaign, He might sound like a man of contrast. On the one hand, our friend from Kansas preached conservative values, personal responsibility, and fiscal discipline. But this son of the Dust Bowl and wounded warrior was also laser focused on caring for the most vulnerable, notching landmark wins on subjects from food insecurity to veterans issues to the rights of disabled. Americans. On the one hand, Senator Dole took pride in our Republican Party. He rose to key roles that were necessarily somewhat partisan, first leading our Senate Republican Conference for many years, and then leading a presidential ticket. But he was also a consensus-finding legislator, an honest broker with deep friendships and working relationships that spanned the aisle. On the one hand, our colleague was earnest, unironic, and somewhat serious, a true greatest generation Midwesterner. But he also wielded a charming, disarming, and self-deprecating sense of humor, whether he was cracking one-liners often at his own expense or doing a joint appearance with his comic impersonator. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky on the Senate floor. The Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, also remembering Bob Dole. Now, Madam President, yesterday our country lost a great statesman, and many of us in this chamber lost a dear former colleague. Senator Bob Dole, who represented Kansas in the Senate for 27 years and who served three years as Senate Majority Leader, passed away yesterday at the yesterday morning at the age of 98. 
Through that, throughout his life, Bob Dole redefined and elevated what it has meant to be a public servant. He was born not to wealth but in poverty, a son of the, of the Kansas heartland who grew up beneath the shadow of the Great Depression. As a young man, Bob unblinkingly answered the call to serve by enlisting in the Army during World War II, where he earned two Purple Hearts and a Bronze Star. After his election to the Senate, Senator Dole quickly won the admiration of his colleagues with his candor, his sharp wit, his penchant for good-natured ribbing. But beneath all that was an unquenchable desire to get things done in this chamber. While he frequently sparred with Democrats, some of his greatest achievements were bipartisan endeavors, including his work to pass the Americans with Disabilities Act, legislation to strengthen Social Security, and revamping federal nutrition programs. Despite rising to the top ranks of his party, Senator Dole always kept close relationships with those on the other side of the aisle. Senator Dole exemplified the greatest generation. While I never had the pleasure of serving in the Senate with him, I always admired his steadfast advocacy for veterans, for Americans with disabilities, and his love for his country. For the information of all, Senator Dole will lie in state this Thursday under the Capitol Rotunda, where we will pay tribute to his life and to his legacy. I thank the Speaker and Leader McConnell in helping make this event's ceremonies possible. For today, I join all my colleagues in mourning the loss of this great public servant, and I wish all of Senator Dole's family my deepest condolences. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer on the Senate floor. And word is coming in, various sources telling media outlets that there'll be a state funeral for Bob Dole on Friday at Washington National Cathedral, and then his remains will be transported to his home state of Kansas for memorial services, and that he'll be interred at Arlington National Cemetery. President Joe Biden on Sunday saying of Dole, with whom he served in the Senate for more than 20 years, calling him an American statesman like few in our history, adding a war hero and among the greatest of the greatest generation, and to me, he was also a friend whom I could look, for, look to for trusted guidance or a humorous line at just the right moment to settle frayed nerves. More from the Senate floor and Democrat Patrick Leahy of Vermont. Madam President, I know many senators will be speaking further on this floor uh, about one of the most distinguished uh, senators, certainly I've had the honor to serve with, and that's Bob Doe. Senator from Kansas, former majority leader. Uh, we will hear, as we should, of his bravery, courageous nature in World War II, how he overcame the horrific um, injuries he received to go on to a life of service, continued service to the state of Kansas. We can have so many wonderful memories of him, how he and the Democratic leader would meet in person or by phone several times a day. The comments they made about each other, uh, I can always take his word, he never surprised me. And that's the way he was. He was the way a senator should be, always kept his word. But I also think of the personal things when he went to Europe, to Italy, to represent President Ronald Reagan on D-Day. President Reagan was going to be in Normandy, and he asked um, Senator Doe to go over and represent him in Italy, and there'd be several Congressional Medal of Honor recipients on board the plane. I was honored that he wanted to make it a bipartisan trip, and he asked me and my wife, Marcel, to join him on the trip to, uh, to Italy. But the reason I mention the trip is that these Congressional Medal of Honor recipients, all for enormous bravery, they, like so typical Congressional Medal of Honor recipients, did not brag about what they did 
they were just so honored to talk to Senator Doe about what he did. Senator Doe tried to be very modest about his exploits and would talk to them about those exploits of theirs that brought about the receipt of the Congressional Medal of Honor. They would brush it off, but they would, but Senator Doe, what about this and what about that? And all the way through, he was great sense of humor, self-deprecating, but everybody in that plane realized this was a true hero of, of that war. Senator Patrick Leahy from Vermont, a Democrat, and the Senate President Pro Tem, longest serving member currently on the Senate floor. Some former presidents, both parties, remembering Bob Dole with admiration. Republican Donald Trump writing, Bob Dole was an American war hero and true patriot for our nation. He served the great state of Kansas with honor, and the Republican Party was made stronger by his service. Democrat Bill Clinton, who beat Bob Dole in 1996, calling Dole's example one that should inspire people today and for generations to come. Republican George W. Bush saying that Dole represented the finest of American values. And Democrat Barack Obama writing, Senator Bob Dole was a war hero, a political leader, and a statesman with a career and demeanor hearkening back to a day when members of the greatest generation abided by a certain code, putting country over party. Presidential historian Richard Norton Smith, founding director of the Dole Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas, joined C-SPAN on this morning's Washington Journal to discuss the legacy of Bob Dole, including his relationship with the modern Republican Party. Even now, uh, there's controversy uh, attached to Senator Dole's name. There are certainly people, uh, I'm sure a number of people in your viewing audience this morning, who um, have not forgiven him, in effect for twice endorsing Donald Trump, um, a man who in many ways was his polar opposite in terms of uh, character and service. Um, And there are those who will ask whether party royalty uh, demanded too much. Um, The the fact is, Dole was um, a party man. Um, And he, I, I often thought, when you were talking about 96, the campaign in 96, it was a sense that he, I don't think he ever really thought he was going to win that campaign. Uh, Bill Clinton was riding a crest of a very strong economy and uh, was in a, a very strong position throughout throughout the campaign. I always sensed that for Dole, it was enough of an honor to have been nominated by his political party. And again, this is kind of a throwback. It's um, when political parties defined um, our politics and our uh, political leaders in, in a way that I think is 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 rare today. So um, I, I think he never lost that sense of party royalty, uh, and and you could argue that in some ways uh, um, he outlived um, the period when um, that kind of royalty was was um, you know invariably considered to be a uh, an asset. But I think the larger issue, the, the bipartisanship that Dole practiced when he was a uh, Republican leader of the Senate and that led to achievements like the Social Security um, rescue or the, the, the Martin Luther King birthday bill, that kind of, part of, of bipartisanship has virtually disappeared. Richard Norton Smith is a presidential historian and founding director of the Dole Institute of Politics, also an author, joining C-SPAN this morning on The Washington Journal. The Elizabeth Dole Foundation, named for Bob Dole's wife, who's a former U.S. senator herself from North Carolina, the foundation tweeting, Today would have been the senator's, plural, 46th wedding anniversary. While our hearts are heavy with the loss of Senator Bob We're grateful to have witnessed their love, a love that spanned decades, different seasons of life, and only grew stronger over time. Hashtag remembering Bob Dole. And there's a photo as well of the the happy couple. If you search C-SPAN's video archive at C-SPAN.org for Bob Dole, you get over 2,000 results. Half of them, his work on the Senate floor, dealing with nominations and legislation and such. In 2011... The Dole Institute of Politics paid tribute to him, and he spoke there 
talking about his loss in the 1996 election to President Bill Clinton, his retirement from the Senate to focus on the campaign that year, and what he's learned from public service. I left the Senate voluntarily, but I I didn't leave politics uh, voluntarily. (laughs) I kept asking Clinton, I said, I think there should be a recount. I kind of feel in some of those states, you know, if we had a recount, I could be president. But in the meantime, we've become great friends and get along. And I guess my, uh, all I want to say, and then I'll sit down, is that, you know, I found in my political life, the one word that means a lot is trust. You've got to be willing to trust one another if you're going to get anything done. I mean, if I tell you I'm going to support this and that's all, you know, well, nobody's going to, you're not going to get anywhere. You've got to have a little flexibility. And that's what Ever Dirksen said. He said, I'm a man of strong principle. One of them is flexibility. <laughs> and, and he's right. I mean, you, you, sometimes you have to give a little. Ronald Reagan used to say, get me 70, 80 percent and I'll get the rest next year. So he wasn't this hard right conservative that some people portray him as today. But anyway, that was a great experience. And then I left the Senate in June of 96. And uh, it, was, uh, it was kind of a tearful departure because, you know, you've got a lot of friends there and a lot of staff and if you don't have good staff you don't do a good job and I had a good staff and some as I said some are here this evening and they never got any credit but they did most of the work but I do think keeping your word whatever you do is is vital Bob Dole in 2011 from C-SPAN's video library Nelson Warfield was National Press Secretary for Senator Dole's 1996 presidential campaign, and he joins us now by phone. Thanks for taking the time. Your thoughts on thank you, Michael. Your thoughts on the on the passing of Bob Dole. Well, I, as you mentioned, I had the honor of working for him uh, throughout his 1996 campaign for president. I I came on board in uh, March of '95 and served with him through January of '97, and. Uh, I think everyone in Dole's circle knew this day was coming, but uh, it's it's it struck a lot of us pretty hard anyway. He was a unique American. Uh, he occupied a, a place in American politics that, that might be no longer there for uh, for our democracy, and uh, it's uh, it's a, a turning point, a milestone, and uh, it, it means quite a bit. There have been praise and tributes today from both Republicans and Democrats. You said that's from a, a different era. Did you see a spirit of bipartisanship when you worked for him? Well, I will tell you, Bob Dole was a fierce competitor. Uh, th- this is a guy who, before the war, when he was in school, was a track star. He liked to win. So although it's certainly true he was a bipartisan, he liked to post Republican wins as much as he could. That being said, he also recognized that at the end of the day, in a legislative body like the U.S. Senate, you had to get Republicans and Democrats to come together to get anything done. So you often get the feeling, I often get the feeling today that much of what happens up on Capitol Hill is a sort of a, a dance, sort of a game. Uh, the Republicans will push one way, the Democrats push another. And Dole was perfectly willing to push, but he wanted to get things done. He wanted to accomplish things for the country. So, yes, he was bipartisan. Uh, he was absolutely a Republican. And I think your question is a good one because it, it draws a contrast to, to what happens today. Uh, you have to make a compromise and to bring people along sometimes. I mean, Dole's title was leader of the Senate. I think he was more shepherd of the Senate because the herd had to decide to follow him. He couldn't command them. And that, that required bipartisanship. And uh, it sometimes, particularly in a in a competitive uh, Republican political environment, when you're running for higher office like president, uh, it, it caused him uh, to face some challenges. Yep, but he, he challenges he was not afraid to face. You wrote an opinion piece this weekend for the New York Times. The title is, I tried to change Bob Dole. Now I realize he was right. What did you mean? Well, the modern, you know, Bob Dole got elected to the United States Congress in 1960. That was the year I was born. 
So when I came on board his campaign in 1996, there was a significant difference in age and probably a difference in perspective. You can certainly assume that. I was a, and am a campaign operative, uh, a mechanic uh, who has a certain set of tools in his toolbox that he wants to use to, to win an election. Bob Dole was never comfortable with the packaging and the sort of uh, process that modern campaigns are um, made up of. He didn't like to be handled. He didn't like to just repeat talking points someone would hand in front of him. And like we just mentioned before, he didn't like to use the legislative process for, for campaign gain. And at the time, that was frustrating to a, to a mechanic like me. I thought I knew what I was doing. I, I thought the campaign would go through all the typical maneuvers of a modern political campaign. And, and it was it was a sort of a puzzle why Bob Dole wouldn't do it. Now, over time, I've come to appreciate that Bob Dole wasn't not hearing us when we gave him this advice. We weren't hearing him. He wanted to be authentic. He wanted to be himself. And I come to believe and very much treasure that because I think that that kind of authenticity is what Americans actually want out of their politicians. They don't want, you know, sound bites and bumper sticker slogans. So I'm proud that Bob Dole won most of those struggles. And he was intent on speaking in his own voice, and he did. Now, the political consultant in me says, wow, if he just used our talking points, that'd be great. The answer for America is probably it would be greater if we had more politicians who were authentically themselves. And uh, that's sort of what the point of my, uh, my opinion piece was. We're talking with Nelson Warfield. When people remember somebody who's passed, it it often turns to the the humorous times, and campaigns uh, are legendary for that. Do you have any stories that you can share from from 1996? Well, Bob Dole was probably the the, the greatest practitioner of the laconic phrase in American politics since uh, Calvin Coolidge. He had a, a very dry sense of humor. And it was a sense of humor that was informed by history. So often he would make reference to some sort of event that had happened that the reporters that were a fraction of his age had no real idea about. But there also was, a even in 1996, emerging the sort of performance aspect of politics you see on a lot of cable TV now, where you're supposed to talk in package sound bites. And an example of that, uh, I remember one night on a, a overnight flight, a late night flight from one stop to another, uh, the reporters that traveled with us uh, came up to the front of the plane to talk with Dahl. And one of the reporters asked this incredibly overheated and you know, self-important question. If you could speak to every voter in America, Senator, what would your message be? Which is essentially a silly question, right? I mean, it, it's it's asking for a soundbite. And, uh, you know, a, a politician like Bill Clinton might have bitten his lip and shed a tear. Almost any politician would, would you know, spout off a bumper sticker slogan. Dole deadpan to him. Beats me. <laughs> it was just hilarious. It, it, you know, it punctured the moment. Uh, and, and that was dull. He could do that. The problem was that the reporters didn't kind of get that. So we had to contend with a, a number of uh, reports thereafter about Dole lacking a vision. And those were all written, in my opinion, by reporters lacking a sense of humor. Nelson Warfield was National Press Secretary for Senator Dole's 1996 presidential campaign, now a Republican consultant. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. And Washington Today continues in a moment. The weekly podcast is a unique offering from C-SPAN. We tape it right here in the C-SPAN studios in beautiful downtown Capitol Hill. In the town where extremes get all the attention, this isn't more extreme opinion. It's extreme history. From what's new and happening right now, relive the history you know. So listen, follow, and enjoy the C-SPAN podcast, The Weekly. Find it wherever you get podcasts. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the free C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you get your podcasts. A story from Reuters, the United States said on Monday it will not send government officials to the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing after China pledged unspecified countermeasures against any such diplomatic boycott. President Joe Biden said last month that he was considering such a diplomatic boycott amid criticism of China's human rights record, including what Washington says is genocide against minority Muslims in the western region of Xinjiang. 
White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki with the announcement today at her daily news conference with reporters. The Biden administration will not send any diplomatic or official representation to the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics and Paralympic Games, given the PRC's ongoing genocide and crimes against uh, humanity in Xinjiang and other human rights abuses. The athletes on Team USA have our full support. We will be behind them 100 percent as we cheer them on from home. We will not be contributing to the fanfare of the games. U.S. diplomatic or official representation would treat these games as business as usual in the face of the PRC's egregious human rights abuses and atrocities in Xinjiang, and we simply can't do that. As the President has told President Xi, standing up for human rights is in the DNA of Americans. Uh, we have a fundamental commitment to promoting human rights, and we feel strongly in our position, and we will continue to take actions to advance human rights in China and beyond. Uh, the Chinese Foreign Ministry has already suggested that it'll be countermeasures, firm countermeasures, I believe the term that they used. Have they indicated uh, uh, to the administration yet what sort of action that they might take uh, for this move? Well, I don't have anything to read out in terms of their intentions or what they would convey uh, from officials from the PRC. But our view is that's not the right way to view or frame our relationship. Uh, our view is that uh, cooperation uh, on transnational issues is not a favor to us. It is not a transaction. The PRC should be taking action on issues uh, where, uh, there are, where the global community, uh, to meet the needs of the global community. Uh, and that's what they should do uh, in order to be a part of leadership in the global community. So I don't have anything to read out on their front. They can certainly speak for themselves. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki with reporters in the White House briefing room. The Winter Olympics in Beijing begin February 4th. And the last full U.S. boycott of an Olympics was 1980, when President Jimmy Carter ordered it of the Summer Olympics in Moscow in response to the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan. That year, 65 countries in total boycotted. And then four years later, the Soviet Union led a boycott of the Summer Olympics in Los Angeles. From the Washington Post, there's this. With Russian troops massed along the border with Ukraine, President Vladimir Putin is expected to issue President Biden an ultimatum during their video meeting Tuesday. Guarantee that NATO will never expand into Ukraine or Russia might soon launch an offensive against its neighbor. The video call comes during an unprecedented low point in U.S.-Russia relations, especially over Ukraine. The White House has threatened Russia with serious consequences, believed to be sanctions that would cut the country off from the global financial system if it pursues military action against Ukraine. That was from The Washington Post. More on all this, back to the White House briefing and Press Secretary Jen Psaki. Should Americans be prepared for the likelihood to see American forces on the ground in the region in the event that Russia does invade? Uh, I'm not going to get ahead of the president's conversations with our uh, tra his transatlantic partners, which is going to happen later this afternoon, and we'll provide you a list of who will be participating in that call as soon as those scheduling details are finalized. Um, but I would say that our objective here, uh, Cecilia, is uh, conveying uh, diplomatically that uh, this is the moment uh, for Russia to pull back their military buildup at the border, that diplomacy is the right path forward here, but that we are going to continue to coordinate closely with our partners, our transatlantic partners, on a range of economic sanctions and steps that couldn't be taken should uh, President Putin decide to move forward. And how would the White House characterize relations with Russia heading into this call right now? Uh, I think uh, our objective from the beginning of the President's time in office has uh, not been to escalate the relationship, but has been to move to a more uh, stable footing in the relationship. Uh, but certainly that means that we can raise concerns where we have them, uh, specifically about areas uh, like the military buildup we've seen on the border uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we all, many of us lived through uh, a similar playbook back in 2014. Uh, and uh, the President is not going to hold back in conveying his concern and also conveying uh, our conversations and our preparations uh, should they be warranted. Uh, we don't know that President Putin has made a decision. We don't know that yet. Uh, but that's why this is an opportunity to have a conversation. But there's also an opportunity in this call uh, to have a conversation about a range of topics where uh, there can be mutual interest, uh, whether it's uh, Iran's nu capability, nuclear capabilities as a member of the P5 plus one talks and what that looks like moving forward, uh, and other uh, strategic stability issues where we have worked together in the past. 
White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. Associated Press adding this, the sanctions now imposed on Russians include asset freezes, bans on doing business with U.S. companies, and denial of entry to the United States. But in seeking to punish Russia, the West over the years has weighed even bigger financial penalties. That includes the so-called nuclear option, blocking Russia from the Belgian-based SWIFT system of financial payments that moves money among thousands of banks around the world. This is Washington Today. Attorney General Merrick Garland announcing a federal lawsuit against Texas over new legislative district boundaries. The Justice Department says the maps drawn with numbers from the 2020 census violate the Voting Rights Act by diluting the strength of minority voters. Today, the Justice Department has filed suit against the state of Texas for violating Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. As the Supreme Court has observed, a core principle of our democracy is that, quote, voters should choose their representatives, not the other way around, close quote. Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act requires that state voting laws, including laws that draw electoral maps, provide eligible voters with an equal opportunity to participate in the democratic process and elect representatives of their choosing. The complaint we filed today alleges that Texas has violated Section 2 by creating redistricting plans that deny or abridge the rights of Latino and black voters to vote on account of their race, color, or membership in a language minority group. In a moment, Associate Attorney General Gupta will describe our complaint in more detail. As many of you know, in 2013, the Supreme Court effectively eliminated the preclearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act, which had been the department's best tool for protecting voting rights. Earlier this year, I noted that this redistricting cycle would be the first to proceed since 1960 without the protection of preclearance. But I also said that the department would use all available authorities and resources to continue protecting the right to vote. In September, the department published guidance based on decades of precedent, explaining that Section 2 prohibits vote dilution. Vote dilution occurs when an electoral practice minimizes or cancels out the voting strength of members of a racial group or language minority group. When we issued that guidance, I noted that discriminatory redistricting schemes are illegal and that the department would assess jurisdictions compliance with those laws during this redistricting cycle. The department's career voting law experts have assessed Texas's new redistricting plans and determined that they include districts that violate the Voting Rights Act. Attorney General Merrick Garland at the Justice Department, he referred to uh, Associate Attorney General Gupta, that's Vanita Gupta, she heads the Civil Rights Division. You can find the full news conference at our website, cspan.org. Texas's Attorney General Ken Paxson, a Republican, tweeting, The Department of Justice's absurd lawsuit against our state is the Biden administration's latest ploy to control Texas voters. I am confident that our legislature's redistricting decisions will be proven lawful, and this preposterous attempt to sway democracy will fail. Back in Washington, President Biden saying his Build Back Better spending proposal that's passed the House, will soon be debated in the Senate, will lower the cost of prescription drugs for millions of Americans. The president spoke from the White House East Room. So I'm committed. I'm committed to using every tool I have to lower prescription drug costs for Americans, consistent with the drug companies getting a fair return on their investment. To really solve this problem, We need the Senate to follow the House of Representatives' lead and pass my Build Back Better bill. In addition to the specific progress that the Build Back Better bill is going to make for families facing diabetes, it will also take the additional step of lowering drug costs for people on Medicare. Right now, the only thing Medicare is not allowed to negotiate, they can negotiate the cost of doctor's visits, hospitalization, all the rest. The one thing they can't, as a matter of law, They are not allowed to negotiate the price for prescription drugs. For everything else, doctor's visits, crutches, they can negotiate. My plan gets rid of that prohibition. What I'm proposing is that we negotiate a fair price, one that reflects the cost of research and development and the need for significant progress, excuse me, need for significant profit. But that is still affordable to consumers. Right now, drug companies will set the price at whatever market will bear. My plan also caps the amount that seniors on Medicare 
have to spend on prescription drugs each year to no more than $2,000 per year, with Medicaid and drug companies picking up the rest of the cost. And again, our plan says that any drug company can only raise prices based on the rate of inflation and caps insulin cost sharing at $35 a month. So let me close with this. I've long said health care should be a right, not a privilege in this country. And the women I've met with today, and millions like them, are the reason why. People for whom the cost of one drug is the difference between hope and fear, life and death, dignity and dependence. We're closer than ever to passing my Build Back Better bill and providing people suffering from diabetes and so many other diseases the medicines they need and the dignity they deserve to be able to afford them. President Biden at the White House today. Lowering prescription drug prices, just one part of the Build Back Better bill, the $1.75 trillion social spending and climate programs bill that Congress is considering. A version has passed the House. The Senate is next. And today, the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer outlining in a letter to his colleagues that, yes, he expects that, that they will pass a bill before Christmas. As the president was leaving the room from in the White House, he was asked by a reporter whether that could happen by Christmas. He answered, as early as we can get it, we want to get it done no matter how long it takes. Before they get to that bill, though, there are some other items on the congressional agenda. We spoke about that this morning with Roll Call Deputy Editor Jason Dick. This week, uh, the, the, you know, both chambers would like to at, at least make some significant progress, if not pass, the, uh, the, the Pentagon policy bill, the National Defense Authorization Bill. It stalled in the uh, Senate after passing the House earlier this year, last week, uh, over a disagreement about amendments. And so the, the plan now is that the leaders of the Senate and House Armed Services Committee will, will kind of conference it themselves, if you will, uh, and then the House will pass that uh, at some point. This is on the, uh, the House schedule for the week. The, the House Majority Leader, Steny Hoyer, sent out a, a, a note saying that they hope to consider the, their version of this, and then they will send it over to the Senate, and the Senate will pass it, theoretically, and it'll head to the president. Uh, that there's There are still some real sticky issues that they need to resolve in that, particularly uh, when it comes to uh, how military justice is, is, uh, is configured uh, in, in the Pentagon. There's been a push to re- remove some parts of the military justice system from the command structure, particularly when, with sexual assault. So there's one of those like big topics that is still uh, hanging over this process. Uh, there's also the debt limit. Uh, th- this may not get done this week, but it certainly needs to get done in the next couple of weeks. The, the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has said that uh, December 15th uh, is, is the date where they, Congress needs to send something by that date to the president to either suspend the debt limit or to raise it to a certain level. Uh, how we get there is sort of an open question. Um, the, you know, the Republicans, uh, particularly in the Senate, have said that they are not going to be a, a part of raising uh, the debt limit or suspending it again. And they want, the, uh, they want Democrats to use the budget reconciliation process, which averts a filibuster. Uh, for that, that gets into all kinds of things, all kinds of procedural things that could just add a lot of days and a lot of minutes to the clock, if you will. So it's unclear when they're going to start that process. This is also on the House schedule, so we'll see. Uh, but you know, there, we're also in the middle of another uh, big you know, debate over the Build Back Better plan. The, this is also um, proceed, this is in the Senate now, the House passed it earlier, uh, you know, and, and um, the Senate is, is sort of debating, the parliamentarian is looking at various aspects of it to see if it adheres to the rules of this reconciliation process. So those three, those are the three big ticket items uh, that, that the, uh, the Congress wants to, to dispense with before the end of the year. Um, they, and again, the, I, I dislike you know, so much attention to like the clicking to- uh, or the, cl- <laughs> the ticking clock, if you will, uh, or the pinched calendar or anything like that, but it really does feel like even though we've got a few weeks before the end of the year, this is going to be a, uh, a crammed schedule. And the fact that we don't know the exact venues, like the exact lanes that a lot of this legislation will pass or uh, when is, is concerning for a lot of people on the Hill. Jason Dick is deputy editor of Roll Call, joining C-SPAN on Monday morning's Washington Journal. On Wall Street, the Dow up 646, NASDAQ up 139, S&P up 53. 
from Associated Press, all private employers in New York City will have to require their workers to get vaccinated against COVID-19. The mayor announced Monday imposing one of the most aggressive vaccine rules in the nation. The move by Mayor Bill de Blasio comes as cases are climbing again in the U.S. and the worrisome Omicron variant is gaining a toehold in New York and elsewhere around the country. That was from AP. Mayor de Blasio made his announcement first on MSNBC this morning. We've got Omicron as a new factor. We've got the colder weather, which is going to really create additional challenges with the Delta variant. We've got holiday gatherings. We in New York City have decided to use a preemptive strike to really do something bold to stop the further growth of COVID and the dangers it's causing to all of us. So as of today, we're going to announce a first in the nation measure. Our health commissioner will announce a vaccine mandate for private sector employers across the board. All private sector employers in New York City will be covered by this vaccine mandate as of December 27th. We're going to have some other measures as well to really focus on maximizing vaccination quickly so we can get ahead of Omicron and all Mm -hmm. the other challenges we're facing right now with COVID. And uh, curious, um, first of all, that's anybody and everybody who works in New York City has a vaccine mandate at this point. How do you enforce this? We're going to work with the business community, and we've seen a lot of cooperation so far. When we have put in place our mandate, for example, for uh, restaurants, indoor entertainment, indoor fitness, we actually got a lot of cooperation. There were a few times where we had to penalize people, but it was rare. So we're going to put together the rules, work with the business community, But I'll tell you something, Mm. the fact that this is universal, and and this would be my advice to mayors, governors, CEOs all over the country, use these vaccine mandates. And the more universal they are, the more likely employees will say, "Okay, it's time. I'm going to do this because you can't jump from one industry to another or one company to another. It's something that needs to be universal to protect all of us. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, a Democrat on MSNBC's Morning Joe program, a Similar vaccine mandate for large employers, over 100 employees, was uh, imposed by President Joe Biden, but is currently uh, still before the courts determine if it's constitutional. Mayor de Blasio, by the way, term limited, could not run for reelection this year, so he'll be leaving office January 1st. Spokesman for the mayor saying his vaccine mandate will apply to about 184,000 businesses in a city that has a population of 8.8 million. Congressman Lee Zeldin is seeking the Republican nomination for New York governor, calling the mayor's vaccine mandate job killing and small business suppressing and writing when you dangerously combine a far left lame duck politician who is anti-business, one dimensional, unaccountable, not bright and has perpetual I always know best attitude. You get Bill de Blasio, the worst mayor in America. That statement from Congressman Lee Zeldin. Some new COVID-19 testing requirements for international travelers flying to the U.S. taking effect today. Here's the State Department spokesman Ned Price. Starting on December 6th, today, all air travelers aged two and older, regardless of their nationality or vaccination status, are required to show a negative COVID test taken within one day of their departure to the United States. This policy applies to all air travelers. U.S. citizens, lawful permanent residents, and foreign nationals alike. The tighter testing timeline provides an added degree of public health health protection as scientists continue to assess the Omicron variant. Foreign nationals traveling to the United States, with only limited exceptions, must also be fully vaccinated and provide proof of vaccination status prior to boarding their flight to the United States. President Biden has promised to take every measure necessary to keep the American people safe and to defeat the pandemic. And these are steps recommended by U.S. government medical experts and the COVID-19 response team. The State Department spoke to Ned Price at the start of his briefing. Fox News adding that airlines are required to enforce vaccine rules and could face fines of up to nearly $35,000 per violation if they don't verify vaccine records and match them against IDs. They also have been asked to collect contact tracing information about passengers, and there will be CDC workers spot-checking travelers for compliance. Malala Yousafzai, the Pakistani activist for women's equality who survived a Taliban assassination attempt, later won the Nobel Peace Prize, meeting today with the Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Washington. The topic, 
was rights of women and girls in Afghanistan to go to work and to go to school. Malala reading a letter she brought with her from an Afghan teenager. Thank you so much, Secretary Blinken. Thank you for your time today. And uh, you mentioned that we are here to talk about equality and girls' education. But we know that Afghanistan right now is the only country where girls do not have access to secondary mm -hmm. education. They are prohibited from learning. And I have been working together with Afghan girls and women's activists. And there is this one message from them that they should be given their right to work. They should be able to go to school. And I have a letter from uh, Satuda, a 15-year-old Afghan girl. And she has written mm -hmm. this to President Biden that I will pass on to you to Thank pass you. it on to President. And she writes that, the longer schools and universities remain close to girls, the more our shared hope for our future fades. Girls' education is a powerful tool for building peace and security. If girls don't learn, Afghanistan will suffer too. As a girl and as a human being, I need you to know that I have rights. Women and girls have rights. Afghans have the right to live in peace, go to school, and play. So this is the message of Afghan girls right now. And we want to see a world where all girls can have access to safe and quality education. And we hope that the U.S., together with the U.N., will take immediate actions to ensure that girls are allowed to go back to their schools as soon as possible, women are able to go back to work, and all the humanitarian assistance that is needed for education there is provided. We know that this has been a challenge, and we want more focus to be given to education, to teacher salaries, because these are the barriers that prevent, from, uh, prevent the schools from running. So, uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank, thank you so you. much, and thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and activist Malala Yousafzai at the State Department in Washington, D.C. CNN reports that seizing power in Afghanistan in August, the Taliban have imposed sharp restrictions on girls' access to education and barred women from certain workplaces. The group released a so-called decree on women's rights, setting out rules governing marriage and property for women, did not mention employment or education. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. For more top Washington stories, subscribe to C-SPAN's evening newsletter, Word for Word. Just go to c-span.org forward slash connect to subscribe. Hope you have a good night. C-SPAN's Washington Journal. Every day, we're taking your calls live, on the air, on the news of the day. And we'll discuss policy issues that impact you. Coming up Tuesday morning, Maryland Democratic Congressman Anthony Brown, a veteran and member of the Armed Services Committee, will be on to talk about foreign policy and military issues. Then a look at the debate over the role of parents in education with Russ Vogt, president of the Center for Renewing America. And we'll talk with Chad Berginis, from the Association of State Floodplain Managers on proposed changes to the National Flood Insurance Program as Congress faces a February deadline to extend funding for the program. Watch Washington Journal live at 7 Eastern Tuesday morning on C-SPAN or C-SPAN Now, our new mobile app. Join the discussion with your phone calls, Facebook comments, text messages, and tweets.